good morning everybody i hope you can hear me okay and um, so we're just going to kick off i can see more people joining and um, which is great so welcome to today's um innovation network meeting it's great to have you all with us uh, today we are joined by Shane Waring from Dublin City Council. Um, so Shane manages the DCC Beta unit within the local authority and is going to share more information about that with us today. I won't go into too much detail about the DCC Beta um, unit itself as Shane is going to cover that in his presentation. Uh, but what I will say is that this topic um, aligns quite strongly with the public service innovation strategy, making innovation real. Um, and the DCC Beta unit that Shane is going to present on today uh, covers a number of priorities that are in that strategy. Um, it involves citizen-centric innovation. It puts citizens and users at the centre of innovation to enhance their experience of public services. Uh, it seeks to create a culture of innovation across Dublin City Council, where staff are inspired, empowered, supported, enabled to innovate. And it also works to connect and collaborate across the innovation ecosystem. Um, by capturing and sharing insights, uh, knowledge, lessons learned, and then applying them from beta projects into um, other initiatives down the line. Um, so we hope this session is an opportunity for our Innovation Network members to learn more about DCC Beta, its approach to trialing and piloting, it, piloting innovations, um, how it generates and applies user insights, and perhaps how other local authorities and public bodies can work to integrate this beta model into their own structures. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us on innovation at pair.gov.ie for more information, or you can contact Shane directly. Um, I think he's going to provide uh, some contact details at the end of the presentation. Um, so before I kick off, I just want to remind everybody that the Q&A is open um, and that you can use the chat function in the presentation to share any questions, any thoughts, any suggestions for Shane. And we'll put them to Shane at the end of the session. Uh, please remember that we are recording this session and uploading it onto our YouTube channel and website. So you will be able to share this uh, with your colleagues and watch it back whenever you want. Um, so Shane, I'm going to hand over to you now. Um, I hope that you're able to share your presentation. Looks okay. Yeah, perfect. Jay, does that full screen for you? It is, yeah, we can see it perfectly. <clears throat> so, first of all, I just want to say thanks to Jade for uh, inviting me on this morning. Um, and uh, I always enjoy these presentations um, and talking about what I get to work at. Um, I was just thinking about this morning, and um, I don't know if you know that Japanese phrase, um, you're Ikagi, and it's like, uh, kind of your dream job, and that's what this is for me. Uh, so, I was going to talk to you this morning about uh, Dublin City Council Beta. My name is Shane Waring. I work at Dublin City Council, and I'll just run through it with you now. So, just a little bit about myself. Um, I uh, studied architecture. I worked in uh, City Architects in Dublin City Council. Uh, started back in 2001, I think it was, and um, I took a career break from the City Council uh, for a few years, and during that time, um, myself and two others set up GoCar, which is Ireland's first car sharing service. I then went back into City Council, and then a couple of years later, I was seconded onto a project called Designing Dublin, and that was a multidisciplinary team um, uh, looking at how we could use uh, design thinking in order to um, differently approach uh, issues in the city. That team was uh, maybe half Dublin City Council staff and half um, people from outside. And um, I then went back into Dublin City Council and I was thinking about these three different experiences and I had worked in a private architect's office as well. And I was trying to reintroduce a lot of the things that I'd learned uh, from that private architect's office uh, that worked in specifically in um, kind of ecological or sustainable architecture. So, for example, it involved lots of new materials and different building practices and so on. And so how can you introduce something that is that was quite new to Ireland back then and uh, often in, in many ways actually still is and so on? Equally, uh, with my experience of GoCar, you know, running a private company, how could a local authority have helped us? 
when I was on the Zonny in Dublin, I we had a Dublin City Council steering group, and I could some sometimes see that they couldn't quite understand what we were trying to do, even though I could see um, from in, internally, I could kind of see actually what we were doing was really good stuff. So um, how to better manage these things, and also from a personal uh, perspective, in some ways, uh, this bottom right image, um, uh, previous line manager gave this to me. Um, so this is sometimes how I felt in. Uh, in Dublin City Council, sometimes I wasn't quite sure where, how I could kind of fit in and work best within the organisation. So, um, I was thinking about all these different things and also I had heard these expressions and uh, so this Darwin phrase, uh, it is not the strongest of the species that survive nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And I was thinking about this in terms of how can a city become more responsive to change? And uh, this other one, which is change moves at the speed of trust. So if we want to become more responsive to change, um, that will require trust. And how do we go about that? So when I was originally working on this, I didn't yet have any kids. And now I have a two-year-old and a four-year-old. And this is the four-year-old. In this photo, I think he's maybe one. And um, so since 2015, the World, uh, the World Health Organization has said that kids born since 2015, chances are they might live to be about 100. So how can we think about the uh, city that um, today's children might live in in 100 years time? But equally, their childhood is over maybe in less than 10 years or, you know, in 10 years, 10 or 12 years. So how can we change much faster? And so, you know, how can we think in decades and centuries, but how can we act in weeks and months? And how can we think really, really big, but actually start really, really small and move much faster and change much faster? So I was thinking about all these different experiences that I had, and I was at a um, an internal um, presentation, and I heard one of our engineers talking about something, and she was talking about um, using tree pits to better absorb stormwater, and so she was based in our drainage uh, uh, division and the issue for her was that our parks department kind of owned the tree and um, our transportation department would own the footpath or the carriageway and drainage owned let's say the drain underneath and so on so even something fairly simple immediately overlaps with three different departments and how do you go about it and and so on so if we decide we make it a big formalized project, senior managers get together and they create a team and so on. But if you're an individual staff member and you think it's something that you should, that would be useful for us as an organization to explore, how do you go about doing that? So I was listening to her and I was like thinking about all these different experiences that I had. And I was like, this is something that I'd like to figure out how to solve. So uh, what resulted was Dublin City Council data. And it's an initiative to help us imagine, trial and establish solutions to improve the livability of Dublin City. And the idea is that it provides us with an additional face or an additional brand um, that we can use as necessary. So a brand is both a visual identity, but it's also like about an ethos or an approach and so on. So we, the idea is that we have two brands. We have Dublin City Council, and that is when things are corporately adopted, policy and execution, and we are literally in implementation mode and so on. Or equally, maybe sometimes we want to really clearly signal we are not sure about this. We want we are we are just learning. We're open for conversations here. We want to improve this and so on. Um, and that is this Dublin City Council beta brand. Uh, in case you don't know the phrase beta, um, often the IT industry uses the phrase in beta to signal that a piece of software is um, quite experimental. It'll probably be riddled with bugs and so on. So don't um, you know don't you know make your business rely on it and so on. Um, so it doesn't cancel beta. The aim is that it signals the same. So I'm going to just bring it through a couple of projects just to give you a very quick sense of it. Um, so if you see the top left image there, this was the very first. Um, so put it this way, I was thinking about, I wanted to develop this idea and the way I wanted to do it was I had thought about it for about maybe six weeks and then I, I, I began. And what I wanted to do was try and do a project and use that to help me figure out what uh, processes we might need and to, to better innovate. So every time you see a traffic light, you will uh, nearby or somewhere see a traffic light control box. And often they get graffitied or um, stickered and so on. 
they become unsightly and so how can we solve that so the when i was on the lookout for a product i wanted something that was kind of positive and rel relatively simple and straightforward and bounded and so on so this seemed like a perfect project and so i arranged for uh basically i opened up 11 of our boxes to be uh painted by kind of anyone and um they resulted in the bottom left image that you can see there. So this trial cost 1,100 euro. After about six months, we could see that it had worked and it was then, they were left there for a further 12 months to kind of see how long the paint would last and so on. And uh, you've po possibly seen them around the city because this idea now has, um, it has, it has now changed the brand Dublin Canvas and it has actually rolled out to all four Dublin local authorities. Um, it has the tagline, Colour in the City, and I'd say it's something like now red, one and a half thousand boxes have been pa uh, painted. And um, this solution now is out of beta, I have nothing to do with it anymore, um, and, and so on. To give you an example of a second product, um, if you see the top left image, uh, on one hand we want people to live near the city, we also want them to cycle, but often those two things can conflict because where do you store your bike? And so often people lock it on a pole or so on, uh, they fall down, they get damaged, they're out in the rain, they get stolen and so on. They also get in the way of people trying to walk down the footpath. So this solution looked at bicycle hangers and the idea is that you have a, a container that goes on the street and local residents can use it for their bicycle. So they, they get a key, either physical or digital, and um, they get to store their bicycle in it. So this was trialled on one bike hanger for about five months, cost about four and a half thousand. And that is currently getting scaled up at the moment. Uh, the NTA have uh, provided three million euro funding for that. And there's a waiting list of the equivalent of about 850 hangers at the moment. Um, and that's getting that's about to go to tender shortly. A third project is, again, imagine you live in a two up to down terraced house. They have down pipes that often just spill rainwater directly onto the footpath. So if you're walking along, you're walking in puddles. Maybe if it's cold weather, that becomes icy. Once that water enters the carriageway, often it picks up oils and dirt, and therefore it needs, to, it needs much more cleaning. Uh, which has a cost for Dublin to cancel, depending on where you are in Dublin, that might have to be pumped twice to get to Ring's End. Uh, during storm events, we are, you know, it overloads uh, the capacity of the treatment plant and so on. So this solution was looking at this idea of um, rain box planters. In the bottom left image there, you can see, uh, here you can see, this is the engineer that I originally heard talking about her tree pit idea. So this was her project, and the idea is that this rainwater instead discharges into this rain box planter. And if you eventually have enough um, rainfall, so for example, after a couple of days, that eventually that will fill up and it'll overflow here. That's fine. But it greatly reduces the uh, pressure on our waste, waste treatment plant and so on. So again, the magic of trialing something is this so this was trialed at two different locations six planters three look planters in each location and it was tried for about two years because it involves plants we need to see how they grow and so on do they get weeds do people put a litter inside them the whole trial cost about one and a half thousand but in one of the locations which had the two-story houses and uh, the residents noticed that at night when it after it when it was raining and then it's, if, it's, if the rain stopped at night and it became really quiet they could hear dripping and it was so as a result all the all the residents on at one of the locations for example they all put sponges up the downpipe to reduce this noise so normally how we would have delivered something is is um, a bunch of staff sitting in a not in a meeting room or something would have somehow developed this and it would have maybe you know a team would have been developed and so on and this would have been rolled out across the city only then maybe you start to um, hear about such issues and so maybe we're like, okay, residents don't like this and we just pull the entire thing. So this is the beauty of learning um, really, really small. And so it is just that a little bit of ponding is just happening at the top of the, the planter box and so there's a relatively simple solution and so on. Um, 
So, Dublin City Council, you, uh, Dublin City Council Beta uses beta products to trial issues that we want to learn more about before we, um, you know, implement them. The, the visual bit that people see are the beta projects, but in the back end, you have the you have various aspect, aspects that, you know, public sector staff need in order to be able to deliver a project. And, you know, generally that's invisible and that's what we might call an innovation ecosystem. And I think of it as these six P's. So permission, what gives you permission to do a particular project? What gives you permission to spend time on it and so on? Purse or funding, you know, the three examples I gave you just there ranged between 1,100 euro and 4,500 euro. They are tiny amounts of money. Um, and yet, as a single staff member, you know, you still need to find that money from somewhere. And once you find you are explaining what you want to do, uh, often that can create a lot of work because then people feel by by agreeing to give you that budget, they're actually agreeing to the idea itself and so on. People. So taking that tree pit idea, it needed somebody from drainage, somebody from, uh, let's say, roads and traffic, and it needed somebody from parks. How do you how do how do those people come together? How do you find the uh, staff with the right mindset, rather than let's say the right grade that is often needed for innovation projects? Process, but so uh, change moves at the speed of trust. So how can we develop a process that um, that people trust and so on when we're trying to introduce change to the city? And that also makes sense for us internally as an organisation. Place. So, a lot of these projects use various design methods and, for example, one of those, for example, is design thinking. Design thinking might require you to put post-its on a board and, you, as you can see, some here behind me. Um, but often, staff just sit in, a, in an open plan office, you know, where it's something as simple as how can they how can they use design thinking? They can't. Often, they don't even have anywhere to stick a post-it. So, we need places, both physical and digital, in which we can innovate. Sometimes that is a physical room where maybe staff can come together and work and leave their work behind them and come back to it a few days later or a week or two later. And equally, we need maybe digital places where we can discuss projects. So for example, you know, DC Beta has a website where trials go up and that's where, uh, you know, where can you, where can we discuss these, uh, where can we discuss these projects and so on, and that's social media, etc. These These physical and digital places. Partners is the external one. So, for example, um, I have linked with um, NCAD a couple of times or, you know, external people that you might link with to do projects. Well, I find it useful to kind of think about those six P's um, when thinking about, you know, various aspects that might need to be developed. And again, these came about from actually trying to do projects and hitting friction points and kind of going, OK, why is this occurring? OK, it's because of this and, uh, you know, developing this that way. Um, so is this blurred for all of you, Jade? No, we can see it. It's a little bit small, but. Okay, um... grand. So I was in the very earliest days, a beta project was just a beta project. That was it. There was, I wasn't thinking about stages or anything. I came out of a meeting that I'd had with, um, a fellow staff member discussing a project and. I was reflecting afterwards that I had found the meeting really frustrating and I was trying to figure out why. And what I realized was that the uh, the debate was happening at three, kind of in three different levels. One was one minute we were discussing national legislation and, you know, why a particular idea might not work or might work and so on. The next minute we were maybe discussing, well, if this is a success, who's going to run it? Who's going to fund it? We don't have the staff for it all those sort of in, internal aspects. And then also there is very like, you know, high hyper local specific issues. For example, I wouldn't put it there because we often have problems with that particular shopkeeper or whatever it is. So um, when you're trying to discuss something new, it's very difficult if, you discuss, if the debate is at those very different levels. And it's very difficult for an individual to have knowledge at those three different levels to have a very deep understanding of national legislation and also very local things and also all those, you know, the various aspects of internal politics, politics and so on. 
So as a result, the way over the years, the way beta products have evolved is now there's three stages. So the first stage is a concept stage, and that is, should we do something? Is something a good idea? And what that is looking at is, uh, so let's say taking the bike hangers, do they cause any problems? Do they block drains? Um, maybe we think it's a nice idea, but actually do any of the users actually end up using it? Maybe they actually all find it more convenient to keep their bike in their um, in their hallway and so on. Uh, maybe you start to find out how far away from somebody's home it can be. So you're starting to learn about the idea. At that stage, um, an idea has to prove that it's a good idea. Uh, so the assumption is that something is a terrible idea until it proves otherwise. And at the end of concept stage trial, they are fully removed. The second stage then would be as you're scaling it. So you now have found out, so you now have found out, let's say bike, bike bunkers seem to be kind of a good idea, but kind of actually, how can we deliver it? Who's going to fund it? Where will that funding come from? Who's going to staff it? Do we run it in-house or do we procure it externally? Uh, and so on. This is also where maybe branding might come in. So for example, what do we call it as a service? And then the final stage would be uh, local specific input. So the first stage, you know, you're kind of going, okay, yeah, everyone is happy with the idea of bike hangers. The second stage might be, we've now figured out how to deliver them. And you might love the idea, but maybe you don't want one directly outside your front door, or maybe you do want it directly outside your front door. So uh, we gather that very, you know, that final local um, input as we implement the solution. So upgraded projects, there's this public Trello here. Um, if you don't know Trello, look it up, it's a, it's a great tool. So here's a public Trello. So um, the way projects happen is there is a suggestion link on the website. Anyone can suggest, link, uh, suggest a, a project. It forces you to have to explain what's the issue that you're trying to solve um, and so on. They get prioritized and then they run through these three stages and uh, eventually they uh, are archived. So archived could mean that they have now scaled up and they're now out of beta, or it could be that we, as a result, we learned actually, we don't need to do this, it's not a very good solution, or no one needs this and so on. Or it could be that um, uh, another solution has come along that's replaced it, that's actually better, so we don't need to do something anymore. And As I was saying, concept stage trials are removed. So here is the before the trial with the uh, traffic light boxes. Here's the issue. Here was the proposed solution. At the very end of the trial, it was repainted gray to signify the trial is finished. And within two months, the issue had reappeared. So the various advantages of um, removing a concept stage trial. Well, one is it entirely changes your mindset. You know at the end this is going to be removed. So you know you're not trying to solve a particular issue somewhere. You're, you are in learning mode and you're trying to figure out, is this something that we should do um, generally as an organization or as a city and so on? So it changes your mindset as a staff member. Equally, it changes the mindset of the citizens commenting on it and so on. They know this is going to be removed. So they know you're, only, you're trying to discuss the concept and not should it be on this particular street and so on. Often you don't hear feedback from people until actually the solution has been removed. So um, people call out and say, God, I love that. Where's that gone? You know, I thought that was great and so on. So often you get a whole pile of feedback only after you remove it. And also it's useful to start to see if the issue has reappeared, etc. So just to give you a sense of this, let's say take the, um, the bike hangers. Again, there was one trial, one hanger and um, cost four and a half thousand. It was there for about five months, it was removed and so on. I tend to think of those as like almost like a prototype. Then it moves through the scaling stage. Sorry, this it was then reviewed and so on with a public um report. Then it moved into the scaling stage. Uh so it, it, it moved from the transformation unit where I sit to the environmental transportation department. And uh it that's where this project is at the moment. So there's 12 hangers and cost about 60,000. Uh, it's been there for about a year, a year and a half so far, and that is literally very soon, shortly to go to a, to a tender. And at this stage, it developed this brand, Bike Bunkers, and bikebunkers.ie website. And 
September soon and then the local stage will be so the NTA have funded 3 million euro we had 1.5 internally um, earmarked for it but we may, might not need that now with the NTA funding and and so on uh, we've also designed that to potentially scale beyond DCC uh, so for example you know with the domain bikebunker.e so if other local authorities want it they can maybe take it and so on similar to the uh, travel light boxes so um as you imagine, we are implementing solutions. Um, so you've now learned whether something is a good idea. You've now figured out how to roll it out, how to deliver it at a city, citywide. But how do we have that local debate with the residents or businesses on a street? So at the moment, we tend to have two solutions. Either we do nothing, we just put it on your street and that's it. It appears just on your street one day. Or else we do some sort of public consultation and, you know, often that was like, you know, uh, physical meetings and so on in the evenings and people can't make it and so on. So often that's not very scalable. We don't have the resources. So um, one of the things we were looking at, is there an in-between, is there an in-between level, which would be kind of consultation light? So one would be, is there a way to tell people that something is coming and um, seek their local feedback? Um, so, for example, take bike bunkers. Usually, that what that is not asking is, do you agree with the idea of bike bunkers? Nor is it asking you what, how should we deliver these, and so on. We figure those out. What it's asking is, do you think this should be on this side of the street, or maybe as a local resident, you should actually propose it goes on the other side of the street or around the corner or whatever, because you only you as a local resident have that really local knowledge that we, sitting in our side our centralized office, we don't have that. So, how can we tap into that? And equally, how can we generally apply that idea to all sorts of different services? So, for example, let's say we are tree pruning or cutting down a tree. Often that provokes a huge reaction because a tree takes a long time to grow and people feel the tree has just been removed. And there's the council yet again trying to, you know, make our, our city greyer. Whereas actually, maybe we know we those trees are rotting and we are cutting them down and we're going to replace them again or something or give them uh, more space for a root ball. So how can we better communicate what we are actually doing? Um, so this was, so we're trying to develop some ideas around here now. So we're trying different solutions. And this is a video that um, uh, I just tested with Jay just before this. So the sound doesn't work, but I'll play it and I'll just uh, maybe explain a little bit what's happening. This is the opposite. So instead of us as a city council pushing out solutions, how could we get to the stage that maybe almost there's like a neighborhood level um, almost like a neighborhood platform that, so for example, like Stony Batter Beta or um, Darndale Beta, where um, local residents decide what they want to be as a community and how can they trial their way towards that. As a city council, how can we make uh, equipment available for them to trial that and um, how can we support them in terms of, you know, knowing whether the local community wants something or not. So that this would be more like um, a community pulling in solutions. So, for example, take bike bunkers. We have it, once we figure it out if it's a good idea. Once we've got that has passed through the concept stage and the scaling stage, it then becomes available to local communities. For example, to uh, pull into their neighbourhood. And um, the way I kind of think of it is a bit like a almost like a vending machine that uh, communities could almost like have a vending machine of options that they can kind of pick what, whatever they choose and so on. So I'll play this video, but uh, you, you won't be able to hear it, but there's some, there's some uh, text below you can read.
So Jade is going to um, include the link for that video as well um, afterwards. So uh, just to finish as well, so um, I guess at the very start for me, this idea of dumps against the beta was at the concept stage. Like, is this a good idea? Is this approach that everything that I've discussed with you this morning, is it a good idea? And then uh, about four years ago, I moved into our transformation unit. I was in CD Architects and I uh, was running this part-time. Um, so since I moved to the transformation unit, um, essentially what it is, it has moved into the scaling stage. So how can we, how can we better embed this idea of what I've discussed with you this morning? And that's kind of where it's at now. We're still figuring out, uh, you know, those six P's, for example, that I mentioned, we're still figuring a lot of this out and how can we better embed innovation and so on within city council. Uh, we have developed a, as a city council has developed a innovation framework and um, that's still at draft stage. Um, I don't think it's been publicly released yet, but, um, it's going to look at how we better embed all these things and so on. Dunleary, Rathdown um, have established a DLRbeta.e as well um, to take the idea. They are at the very beginning stages. Um, it's kind of the fledgling idea and they're figuring it out as well. Um, and so something I'm looking forward to doing is working with a couple of different local authorities, for, for example, and um, us kind of exploring how to better embed these approaches and so on and learning from one another. And other, so if anyone is from another local authority or anywhere else, uh, reach out and I'd love to chat you. And that is it for me. Uh, there's some contact details and information about DC Beta. Uh, there's the generic email address. Um, if you have any questions or any suggestions or anything, just get in touch and I'd love to chat to you. That's it, Jade. Do you want me to stop sharing? If you could, that would be great. Brilliant. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to drop them into the chat box there. Uh, we'll put them to Shane. Uh, and, um, that was brilliant, Shane. Thanks a lot for, for sharing that with us. Um, I think it's an excellent initiative that uh, reimagines the city and, you know, seeks to change the city and transform it. Um, I think it also demonstrates really tangible outcomes. I, I mean, that Canvas project, I think anyone who sets foot in the city knows straight away about that and sees it everywhere. And it's really, really brilliant. Um, I think your passion and enthusiasm for change is is definitely evident um, and <laughs> almost contagious. Like I'm kind of more inspired now to get out and find where all these beta projects are and start, you know, um, responding to them and giving my thoughts. And I actually, I had seen the hangers and um, the bike hangers. I'm not a cyclist, but I had seen them before and I had seen the, the beta branding on them and kind of looked into it um, a little bit more. It, it was kind of new to me when I, when I saw it previously. Um, I think in the council, and you mentioned that you have your innovation framework that's that's in draft at the moment and that's kind of in development. I think that, like you know, in the council, you have done some extremely innovative things, um, and this is obviously an excellent example of that. Um, and I think it's a brilliant model that you know shows how piloting initiatives and trialing initiatives um, can be can be done. And it's something that we probably shouldn't be so scared of, like you know, to give something a, a trial um, rather than just launch something with like a big bang approach um so i think yeah like it's congratulations for for setting this up and, and operating within the city um and i think and you might talk a little bit about this but did i read that there was kind of international interest in this model or that it's kind of been done around the world yeah so um i think it was i don't know in the first year of setting it up actually i was invited to uh sao paulo in brazil to present to their city council um, or, I don't know, um, present to different EU projects in Rotterdam or different places. Um, you know, some Italian cities have been inter interested and so on. So I think it, there, it's a very, um, I think all different cities are grappling with these same issues. Um, there's nothing here that's, you know, we've no issues here that are unique to us. Um, so if we can kind of crack this, this is something actually that can scale internationally. Uh, and yeah, like, I suppose once, what I would say is sometimes you, you know, it's this far away fields are greener, you look at it on the city and you say they have everything sorted and look, God, they're, they're doing great stuff. Sure, sometimes they do, but often when you, if you were, if you were to pick up the phone and talk to those, in, those staff members behind those, you would find out actually 
the appearance appears great, but actually they're often just, you know, have the same issues as us as well. Um, one thing I really liked um, is how citizen centred, I guess, this this data model is. Um, and you mentioned there about, you know, something that's really important is using that local knowledge um, and then combining it with your central knowledge and your knowledge of kind of the local authority and, and how things work. Um, how have citizens responded generally to this um, kind of beta concept? Is it well received or has there been a bit of? Uh, it has been, so at the very start, I was floored by how positive people were about it. And I think a good benchmark is uh, generally all city, all city councillors are really supportive of it. Uh, so as a proxy representative of all the residents and citizens, I think that's a very good um, litmus test. So I think what's important is that people you make people feel actually yes we actually do want to hear and you also need to convey you need to not be afraid so there's a phrase that says um if you're not slightly embarrassed by what you put out on the street you know you've left it too late so in a way if you're not like god this if i had another week on this i'd definitely get it a bit better if you're you know if this is absolutely perfect you've you've kind of left it too late and you're now going to be probably too precious about it you've probably now spent too much money maybe too much time and so on and so you will get defensive. Naturally, you will just get defensive. You know, you spent five years of your life developing this thing or whatever. But if you get that out after a couple of months or a couple of weeks, you've only spent a small amount of money. It allows you to be open as a open minded as a as a as a staff member. Equally, citizens can sense that and they can see it. They they can see actually this is in the early stages. I can change this. It doesn't feel like a a set of two hundred CAD drawings that they're being asked to change. You know what I mean? It 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 feels. They, they instinctively know that this is early stages and so on. And as time goes on, as we better, ex, you know, as as we f get better at explaining the approach and people get more used to knowing about these stages and so on, um, I think it'll it'll just get stronger and stronger. Okay, brilliant. And um, we've lots of questions and comments coming in. And before I, I look at those and share them with you, um, one question I have, and you kind of touched on it there about, you know, spending five years of your life working on an idea and then putting it out there and kind of getting feedback and the feedback might not be, you know, what you want or what you expect. How do you build resilience in those teams to kind of prepare them for, you know, negative feedback or this just doesn't work, get rid of it? Like, how do you build that resilience in teams? Because I think often, you know, when people have innovative ideas or new projects that are a little bit different, they can be kind of reluctant in case somebody, you know, doesn't say very favorable things about it. So how do you build resilience amongst the, the teams in Dublin City Council that work on these projects? Uh, I, we don't or I don't. Um, okay. I think the key is just get that out, get that out early. Okay. And when they, so often what this is about is backlog. So somebody, a staff member maybe has wanted to do something for the last 10 years and they finally see an opportunity. So uh, so that's probably where that resistance has come from. You know, it's kind of their baby in their head. But so often the best way is get that out there. And when they actually see someone to try to use it or they read a comment, often they kind of go, okay, actually, yeah, they're right. Or, but more often than not, the solution is actually not to just chuck it out. Often you're like, so what I would often say is the underlying problem or opportunity that the person is trying to solve almost almost always is correct. It's the solution that maybe they are proposing to that maybe maybe is right or right, right or wrong. Uh, so I often think for the staff members it's useful to get them to say, OK, what you're trying to solve, you can now see from this trial, what you're trying to solve is actually is needed, but just this isn't the right solution. Let's what other ways could we solve this? You know, so at least then they feel, OK, I, de I did correctly identify something here. It's just, you know, and I think just get that out early, get them equally, let them let them see that, you know, OK, we have now done something with your idea. It only cost it was free or cost 100 euro or cost a thousand quid or whatever. It's only small. We got this out after a few weeks and it helps them be open minded also. OK, brilliant. Um, I'm going to move over to some of the comments. We've got a lot of comments and questions in, so I'll try and get through as many as I can. And um, you might have covered some of this already. So um, 
let's just see what people have said. So this one is in from Elaine and Elaine says that your initiative sounds fantastic and that she is an enthusiastic GoCar user. Um, so Elaine works with community stakeholders and would love to know how you went about establishing community trust and buy-in as sometimes community members can find organisational processes and you know processes with local authorities quite complicated, quite bureaucratic. Um, so how was that community trust built from, from the start? Uh, so in some ways it's easier because most projects at the moment have started at the concept stage. So they are going in somewhere and then they are removed. Mm -hmm. um, so people are aware that there's going to be removed. Oh, sorry. After a while, they realize, okay, you actually did what you said you were going to do, which is actually remove it. You know, so at the start, people weren't that, that they assumed, okay, this doesn't cancel. They've never removed something before. They always keep it there. So in a way, it was just a part of it was just like backing yourself and actually doing what you thought was right, which was put in a trial and removed and so on. And people get used to that. Um, I think the three stages help with that because you, you have trialed a concept somewhere at a Goldilocks location, somewhere that is not too hot, not too cold. Normally how we normally how people pick locations is they say, okay, we have a big problem with this issue there. Therefore, let's trial it there. What they're actually trying to do there is solve it. They're trying to implement, they're trying to solve a problem because that's where we have all these problems. Actually, often there is the worst place to, to trial something because you're having so many problems with that issue there. It'll be a hot potato. It's going to be difficult to actually to properly trial it there. Also, people won't want to remove it at the end because you have so many issues and so on. Also, it might not be representative of your whole organization or your whole city or whatever. It might just be a particular difficult case. And so you should actually, you're better off trying to find a more generic kind of Goldilocks location to trial something. So for example, in, in a city, that's somewhere that maybe has a mixture of houses and apartments, somewhere that's not too wealthy nor uh, too disadvantaged, somewhere maybe, um, you know, that's kind of representative of the whole city. Okay, oh, brilliant. I don't know if that quite answers the question, but um, I can chat to Elaine more afterwards if she wants to get in touch. <laughs> Excellent. Um, well, I, I think as well with, with community trust, I think we're we're so used to things taking a lot of time in councils or in government bodies or other organisations uh, that we're probably not used to this. You know, something is out for a couple of weeks. We're trialing it, we're testing. Like it's a new model, it's a new approach. I think for for people, but um, I think you know over the last two years and and like the impact COVID has had on on the city, I think a lot more people now are used to, you know, concepts of just trialing something. We just need to introduce something quick and trialing it and we will improve it over time we will iterate we will get better so i think as a, as a concept and as a model i think you know the whole beta approach is catching on and um, so pauline says very interesting concept and talks about you know how it can change people's mindsets um, Deirdre said it's a brilliant initiative and it really brings top down and bottom up project planning together with local population engagement at the core. Um, Eddie, thank you for your presentation and said it was really interesting and asked if you could expand on how you gather and manage ideas. And that's something that we've had a lot of questions on recently from our colleagues across the public service. You know, they know that staff and, and citizens have all of these great ideas. So how do you actually go about, you know, collecting them from people and then managing them um, and then ultimately deciding what to act on, what idea to progress. Talk a little bit about that. I heard a phrase recently, which was um, a city can do anything, but not everything. And I think that's true. So or an organization may be the same kind of in, in, in theory. So you have to take, every, you know, you can take all suggestions, but you do have to prioritize them. You only have a certain amount of time. And so the way at the moment people can suggest projects via the website on the suggestion link, or they might discuss it first on social media and eventually maybe gets to a certain stage. And then, you know, um, they might be prompted then to say, okay, now more for now that you've understood your idea a bit more now for, more formally um, enter and so on, or it just kind of, uh, or staff might use the same process. So how projects are prioritized at the moment are kind of against three columns. The first column is how easy will this be to trial? And that is things like um, how much money will this cost? How fast can we get it up? How complex an issue is this? Um, will we have to burn lots of internal goodwill or goodwill with uh, with citizens in order to do this? Those kind of things. The second column then is 
if something turns out to be a good idea, how much return will there be for this? So like, you know, okay, so let's say bike bunkers, maybe you can say actually it's a, it's a citywide scalable solution. It uh, maybe solves all these things, you know, so that kind of thing. So it's like, what's your return on your investment is the second column. And the third column is all things being equal. Are there other things that might nudge something upwards or downwards? And that is things like, well, does this project maybe make the city council more transparent? Does it make us maybe more innovative or design led or um, would this help citizens feel um, more involved in their local community? So it's things of that. So all things being equal, does this kind of have more kind of um, system wide effects? So that's how all projects generally are part at the moment. At the start, it was more curated in a way. I just kind of picked things that were strategic for developing the idea of beta. Um, but we're slowly moving more and more towards uh, that bit more of a rigorous process. And um, uh, then ideally what you're doing is you're getting it getting to a trial as fast as you can, you know, so you have your whole list and you're picking maybe your top 10 and out of those top 10, you're aiming to do a couple of them every year or every few months. And, uh, you know, you're getting it to a trial and actually, you know, learning something as fast as you can. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to take two more questions or sorry, three more questions. Um, the first one is how do you, I suppose, sustain that? corporate support for, for the DCC beta project? Um, like, do you regularly feed into like senior management, senior leadership, um, to kind of have to prove what you're doing or is the support, you know, there for you to, to continue with this? For the platform, Jade, you mean? For D yeah, for the yeah. DCC beta model. Uh, I suppose, so beta itself at the very start, I would say was concept stage itself. It, you know, was this a good idea? After it ran for about three and a half years, I ran it part time between 10% and 50% of my week. Um, and it was then kind of removed, kind of shut down in a way. And a report car, report was produced. And as a result, um, essentially that resulted in it becoming my full time job. Um, partly with the backing of the councillors and um, so I would say it's now figuring that bit out partly is like actually so there's that phrase you know you've been doing a lousy job here comes the smart people so when you're innovating you know I don't know so let's say a project is related to cycling and we have a whole you know department that works on you know transport related things and if a staff member in drainage has an idea who are they you know what gives them the right to now develop this project and so on so you don't do always you know there is always that sense of resistance so how do you you know how do you create that sense of permission um around a project and i think that's why at the concept stage i think it makes sense that a project sits under the transformation unit where i sit is as in it's kind of a neutral switzerland um and that way often what will enable you to bring an innovative approach to us to a solution is that actually you are thinking cross departmentally so i think there's a certain benefit to it sitting under the transformation unit at a concept stage and having heavy input from the relevant departments but also that allows you to kind of bring in all this input from all these different departments but also very much from citizens and then after something seems to be a good idea you are now starting to figure out how to actually embed that how do you how do you fold that solution back into your organization and how are we going to do that in a resilient and sustainable way ongoing and therefore of course that has to very heavily involve the relevant department and so that's when you start to um it starts to shift over to them and becomes their project and their baby okay, brilliant that's so as, as as well as you know citizen engagement there's probably a lot of internal kind of stakeholder <laughs> engagement that, that happens with these projects as well you know when you're work, working across departments sometimes you can do more internal engagement than than external engagement as well so um, sure and again that's the benefit of something being small i mean you're able to say look there's only one bike bunker here there's only one bike hanger on the street if this is a terrible idea that's fine we've only spent four and a half thousand quid we have a bike hanger there at the end of this we can we can give that to charity or go and sell it on or we can return it to the vendor or whatever we can get our money back or you know most of it back so actually you know there's very very little risk here um that's fine if it's a terrible idea and actually that kind of i actually think often prefacing a conversation with this is look this could easily be a terrible idea 
people realize it's not about ego. It's not like, here, you know, here's a staff member on his or her white horse coming in with the perfect solution. You know, it, it actually is a tri trial. It actually is learning. It actually is open to that, you know. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I suppose we can see your background there and we can see that you're you're in a, a lovely room with, you know, blank wall, the whiteboard, <laughs> post-it notes. Um, the ideal setup for you know innovating and, and creative thinking. Um, someone has asked to, to if you could talk a little bit more about innovation and I suppose physical spaces. A lot of people are going to start moving back to the office now. Um, a lot of people in the public sector innovated over the last two years, but probably innovated from their kitchens, from their bedrooms. You know, and um, they're now going to be moving back into the office, uh, in person with colleagues and collaborating in a, a different way. Um, have you any? you know, tips or advice for in-person uh, collaboration, collaborating in an office, like what do people need and how, how do they, they collaborate in person now that we're, we're moving back into that kind of space? After all, Jade, I can send you a link that you can forward yeah. on to the group. But, um, so, uh, so years ago, what I realized was when we were trying to pull staff together from different departments, where did we meet? So often we used to meet in coffee shops and you know, you then couldn't, I mean, you can meet in a meeting room, which is fine, but if you, sometimes if you want people to feel more relaxed and so on, you need a slightly different physical space. Um, but we never had anywhere to leave our work and kind of return back to it and so on. So an early trial was actually looking at, we had lots of, as an organization, we have lots of meeting rooms. So we have lots of rooms to meet and talk and make decisions and so on. But maybe we didn't have any spaces that you could like, Cross departmentally work and actually leave your work behind. So we leave your work behind is actually, I think, the key important bit there. Um, and uh, so literally the month before COVID, we set up a, what we call the collaborative working room. And the idea is that essentially all it was, was we took one of our meeting rooms and we took out the desk and that was essentially it. So generally as an organization here in our offices, we in our meeting rooms, you tend to try to get the biggest desk in that you can, because then it's the most flexible. You can get as many people, you know, it's, it, it makes the room much more flexible, but then it makes it very difficult to ever do something like design thinking, um, with people sitting around a wall and sharing their thoughts and so on. So essentially all that needed was us taking a meeting room and actually literally taking the desk out. It then had to be kind of publicly or sorry, as in cross mentally, um, bookable. So anyone in the organization could book it. In there, there was just a box with post-its and Sharpies and whiteboards. So this kind of whiteboard you can see here behind me, they cost maybe about 20 quid each. So I think we were able to get, like, I don't know, for 200 quid or 400 quid, we were able to get like 20 of them or something. So they just sit in there and that was it. Uh, it costs, you know, so and essentially to do that room maybe cost us 500 quid. And uh, that's all it needed. And uh, in the early days, so we had what maybe yeah, maybe two months of it before COVID hit. Um, and I could see already uh, it gaining huge, huge traction. It, people starting to, you know, getting more and more bookings every single week and people literally just using it in a different way and people just really appreciate having that different type of resource. So that's physical. Um, uh, digitally, we need we will need other solutions like Miro or Mural um, and so on, which is kind of the digital equivalent. And... Um, so that comes down to things like, do staff have access internally or is it firewalled or are there security concerns by your IS department and so on? So um, I know at us as an organization, we have a few things that we have to figure out there as well. Um, but, um, you know, at least we know what we need to do and so on and we're looking at it. Brilliant. Um, and I think it's really interesting what you say about you just need somewhere to be able to leave your work. So, you know, rather than going to a meeting room and gathering all your post-it notes at the end of the session and then having to come in a week later and trying to stick them back up on the wall. Exactly, like the, the, yeah. The, the space to be able to just leave them, come back in a couple of days um, can be really beneficial. Um, and maybe it is as simple as just removing a desk from the room, you know, and, and maybe some of our organisations will, will try that now and they start kind of returning to the office. Um, I'm going to ask you a final question and... Um, then we'll, we'll wrap it up there and just to remind everyone that we have recorded this session and it will be made available um, afterwards as well as some of the, the links and the, the bits that we've we've spoke about. Um, do you have a favourite uh, beta project? <laughs> can, can you pick one? Can you pick oh, one? God, no, I'm no, putting no. you on the spot um, now. 
What I will say is, of course, in a way, the Traffic Light Box artworks were at the start because it was the one that kicked it all off and I found it all very good, you know, very nice and positive and so on. Uh, in some ways, it's my least favourite now because it's 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 the oldest one and everyone always asks me about it and so on. So I, um, I guess at the moment, it's kind of... Uh, if I'm kind of honest, I kind of... I know it's kind of an awful answer, but I kind of love them all um, equally. It's like loving all your children. Um, I'm loving the bike bunkers at the moment because it is literally about to go live and it's about to leave. You know, I won't, I'll have zero involvement and I kind of love it at that stage because then it kind of just, it goes and it kind of becomes its own thing and it, it kind of shows the model is working. Um, and equally, there's another project happening at the moment, which is um, uh, various projects around illegal dumping and waste. And um, so, for example, one of them is about like a search tool to help residents that you would search. So imagine you've just moved into a house. How do you know what day your bin collections and so on? So how do we as an organization reinsert ourselves into that conversation with residents? Um, or there's another one which is shared bins, very like the European model of um, communal shared bins. And so you can imagine how complex and how hot topic that is. So how can you, how do you trial something around that? How do you discuss that? So I'm really um, loving those two projects at the moment as well. Brilliant. So we'll start to see them soon, hopefully on yeah. In data mode and, and the yeah, yeah, yeah. feedback. Um, Shane, we'll leave it there. Um, like I said at the at the start, like it's it's an excellent initiative. Um, and I'm hoping some of our public sector colleagues and, and those across local authorities um will will get in touch and, and look to maybe integrate the model into their own work. Um yeah, it's been a pleasure to have you and and thanks for your part in, in helping to transform the city with this with this model. Um it's we, we like you said we can see it everywhere we go particularly with those canvas boxes i know you probably don't want to talk about them but they are they're they're gorgeous yeah, yeah, they're really, really yeah. nice. i still i still get a buzz when i see them around yeah yeah no they're, they're <laughs> absolutely beautiful um so yeah it's been a pleasure thanks a lot for joining us today and um everyone else that's joined thanks for staying with us thanks for asking your questions like i said we'll circulate the the recording afterwards um, and we'll see you in march for our next session so and Jay, just to say that if anyone has any questions that we didn't get to, if they just want to email them over to beta yep. at dumbcity.e or get reach out on social media, DC beta, um, we try and answer them. Yeah, I'll include that in the email that goes to everyone as well, Perfect. just with the contact details. But thanks a lot, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day.